Uh, good morning, first of all. My name is Rick Long. I'm the General Manager and Associate General Counsel at PEI, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this morning to PEI's Future Fuel Session. As a courtesy to our speaker, you know I'm going to ask this, and everyone else around, please make sure that you silence your cell phones now or, or uh, turn them on mute. As a quick note, I'd also like to remind everyone that the short evaluation form that was on your chair when you came in is really the most important source of feedback that we have as we plan our educational program each year. And so, so sure would appreciate your taking the time to fill that out before you leave the room today. Um, and last, as a preliminary note, let me mention that the slides for today's presentation are available for download on the PEI app, if you have that, have gotten that already. If you've not downloaded the app, you can do that by texting PEI2014 to 99000, and then there's just a download icon and you can see the slides. Let me introduce you to our speaker now. John Eichberger is the Vice President of Government Relations at NACS, where he oversees the association's governmental relations activities, represents the convenience and fuel retail industry before the United States Congress, the administration, and the media, and directs the association's <coughs> motor fuels and energy policy related activities. John is also Executive Director of the Fuels Institute, a nonprofit research oriented think tank dedicated to evaluating market issues relating to vehicles and the fuels that power them. Research done by the Fuels Institute is independent and unbiased and designed to answer questions that will provide decision makers with the most credible information possible so that the market can deliver the best in vehicle and fueling options to consumers. And I'd also add that John has been a great friend of PEI and our staff uh, is really grateful that John would take time and come over to the PEI side of the hall. We really appreciate that and are looking forward to his remarks. So please join me if you would in welcoming <coughs> John Eichberger. Thanks, Rick. You know, coming over to the PE side, PEI side of the hall is nothing like a Republican going to the Democratic side of the Congress. So this is not that big of a stretch. <laughs> At least we're all kind of we're all on the same side. We all know what we're doing. We're all trying to support the same industry. So I was asked to come in and talk a little bit about the future of fuels. Um, spent probably the majority of my time in the last two years focused on this. Fuels Institute was put together to try to provide roadmaps identify ways we move forward to capitalize on opportunities facing the market by coordinating our efforts with the auto industry, with the fuel producers, with the environmental community when possible, with consumer groups, figuring out exactly what it is that we need to do to make sure that the market works the way it should. Too often, we are finding ourselves in silos. The auto industry comes up with their ideas, fuel producers, biofuel producers come up with their ideas, and ultimately, the retail community is left holding the bag. So how can we move forward in a collaborative way to make sure that all stakeholders to the market can profit and take advantage of the opportunity these new things come up? So we keep talking about future fuels, and some of these future fuels are really far in the future. I mean, you may say that they're not even visible yet, um, but thinking about them long term is important, and the reason why is we're really facing a change in our market. <clears throat> Since 2007, according to EIA, gasoline demand has gone down 4.74%. So almost 5% from 2007 to 2013. Their forecast, however, through 2020 is another 4.5% demand destruction. Then if you take the forecast further, and the further you go, the less consistent, less accurate forecasts are, but the trend is telling another 17.5% demand destruction by 2040. Cumulatively, they're suggesting a 25% drop in demand between now and 20, between 2007 and 2040. Or 2030, actually, I forgot that back to 2030 this time. Um, and that's a, that's a key. If we are losing gasoline demand, what's going to replace it? Because they're not driving less. This is a forecast on total vehicle miles traveled. Right now, we're in kind of a stall. VMT in the last couple of years has stalled out and we have plot two. The forecast though is another 30% or 18% increase in VMT by 2030, by 2040, a 30% increase. So consumers are driving further is exp the expectation, yet consuming less gasoline. Something has to take its place. 
And that's why we talk about the future of fuel so often. Because if we aren't thinking what's next, by the time it is there, we're going to be behind the eight ball and not going to be able to take advantage of the opportunities that it may present. Some of the things that people talk about looking forward, and we're going to go through each one in a minute, may not have any viability. Some are absolutely not relatable to our industry. But we have to understand them because if they do gain traction and they do take market share from the gasoline market, what are we going to do? <clears throat> so we take a look. The driving force behind this is cafe standards, fuel economy standards. The primary driver on almost all fuel policy in the United States Congress and the administration is environment. How do we reduce emissions? How do we reduce greenhouse gas pollutions? How do we address criteria air pollutants? The number one way you do that is you reduce the amount of fuel we consume. You remember President Bush said we're addicted to oil, we've got to get off oil. He's not the only one who says that. The push for corporate average fuel economy standards is all about tailpipe emissions. This standard gets up to an equivalent of 20, uh, 54 miles per gallon in 2025. It is based upon a calculated mile equivalency from reducing greenhouse gas reduction from the tailpipe. This is about the environment, and the mandate is real. We're going to see improved efficiency. 61 models in 2013 had higher fuel efficiency than the prior year. The number I have up there is 25 miles per gallon just about last year. We're in the 25 and a half to almost 26 this year. By 2016, we're supposed to be in the 30s. Average fuel economy. That is, what, a 50% increase over now? That could relate into a significant drop in fuel demand. And that's why we're seeing the forecast for that happening. The numbers, we're never going to get to 54. Like I said, that's a calculated standard. Most people expect that by 2025, the average fleet economy of new vehicles will be about 40. Then you have fleet turnover, which could take anywhere from 15 to 20 years to get it. But we're seeing a progressive increase in fuel economy, and that's going to affect what we do. It's also affecting how the automakers are going to market what vehicles they want to produce, and how they view their ability to meet their corporate average fuel economy standards. The penalty for not meeting your fuel efficiency standards is quite hefty, and they are doing everything they can to make sure they hit that nut and exceed it. But different from what they were thinking about in the late 80s and early 90s, meeting their fuel efficiency standards does not mean taking steel and replacing it with plastic and lightweighting vehicles. I remember when I was in Capitol Hill in the late 90s, every time we talked about fuel efficiency, we said, whoa, whoa, whoa. We don't want to reduce the weight of vehicles and, and increase potential danger to the passengers or reduce capacity. The technologies they're bringing to market don't do that. They're bringing in smaller engines, turbo boosted, high efficiency, high performance. You're not going to see new vehicles that have higher fuel efficiency resulting in diminished performance and reduced consumer interest. Consumer interest is paramount. Now, this is the forecast the Fuels Institute did. We asked Navigant Research to do it for us. So I just want to point out, the red line here is the forecast of market share for gasoline-powered light-duty vehicles. 93%, potentially dropping down to 83%. Between now and 2023, a 10% drop in market share, registered vehicles, not sales, this is registered vehicles and gasoline. Now, the line next to is flex fuel vehicles. So it's a little misleading. Flex fuel vehicles can run on E0 all the way up to E85. 99% of them run on gasoline. But they have the potential to run on E85 and higher ethanol blends, and that is a strategy being employed by some of the automakers to try to capitalize on some opportunities. But the bigger growth that I want to point out is this is diesel. Significant increase in diesel. I'll talk about that specifically in a minute. It's all about fuel efficiency, power density, the content of energy in diesel fuel and the efficiency of the engines is really being attractive to the, uh, uh, the uh, automakers. <clears throat> so what will drive the future? There's two things, two primary things. The environment. As I told you, every policy in Washington is driven by environmental protection, environmental objectives. If a new fuel, new technology does not achieve an improvement in environmental performance, it will not survive. Everybody talks about sustainability. And sustainability is usually used as a code word for environmental protection. OK, I'll accept that to a degree. But environmental protection or environmental sustainability in the absence of economic sustainability for the consumer fails. So if we assume environmental protection is the ante to the game, the way that technology wins is it has to satisfy the customer. 
So you can have the most environmentally sensitive product. I've always said consumers and surveys will tell you they want to be green. They say they will spend more for environmentally sensitive alternative. But we know that when they're at the gas pump, the only green they care about is in their wallet. And all their altruistic comments about environmental protection go out the window when they're faced with making a choice between buying fuel or buying something they actually want to buy rather than something they have to buy. So I'm gonna spend most of the rest of the conversation talking about technologies and fuels from the consumer perspective. Assume the fuels we're talking about will meet environmental objectives because they don't have a choice, they have to do that. And at any point, if you have a question, please raise your hand and ask have no problem stopping and addressing any comments you have because I want to make sure that you get the answers to the questions you have as we go through. And if you wait to the end, we may not have time. First thing I want to talk about economics. NAC surveys consumers every month. We survey about 1,100 customers every month. We ask them several questions. Some of the things we ask them are, how do you feel about fuel prices? How do you feel about the economy? What effect do gas prices have on your feelings about the economy? Earlier this year, the Fuels Institute went out and did a comprehensive survey of customers about their attitudes towards vehicles. We asked them, what are the most important attributes when you're thinking about buying a new vehicle? These are the vehicle, these are the people who said, in the next three years, I likely will buy a new vehicle. Fuel economy and cost of the vehicle are the only ones in the high level. 85% of customers say those are the two most important attributes when considering a vehicle. It is all about budgetary issues for the consumer. They recognize that higher fuel efficiency benefits their budget. But if the vehicle they want to buy is $10,000 more expensive in order to get a couple miles per gallon, it's unlikely they're going to do that. So they have to see a value both in the purchase, the maintenance, and the operations. So the other thing we ask them is, how do you feel about alternative fuel vehicles? Would you be interested, would you consider buying a non-gas car? The thing I want to point out, in 2012, 13, and 14, we asked the same exact question of those who are interested in buying a new car in the next couple years. 63% in 2012 said, no, I have no interest, or I'm very like, unlikely to consider a non-gas vehicle. That was in 2012. Two years later, 30%. The interest in alternative fuel vehicles is growing every single time we talk to them. Now, we see a little blip here, but the fact is opposition is going down. They're starting to understand that the hybrid technologies, the diesel technologies, these new vehicles that they're now starting to see on the show, form, uh, show floor room, every time they go and look at a car, they're right there. They don't have to make a special trip to find an alternative fuel vehicle. That's the big difference in consumer acceptance. You walk into a, a showroom, if every vehicle in there is gas, guess what you're going to end up buying? But if you have an option in the same vehicle class to satisfy your needs for that vehicle, there's gas, there's hybrid, there's diesel, there's something else. Now you can start making some value comparisons. We did find that customers, while fuel economy is the most important, they're not going to change their class of vehicle that they care about. So if you're an SUV customer and you want fuel efficiency, you're not buying a compact to get the fuel efficiency. You might buy a crossover utility vehicle, has some of the same capacities and capabilities of your SUV, has a little bit better fuel efficiency. So you'll trade within a class. Most customers, however, will not change their vehicle type preference to get better fuel efficiency. They will just look within that class. And that's where these alternative technologies come into play. Now they can compare. This SUV, let's say it's a Yukon, is diesel, this one's gasoline, this one's a hybrid. What's the cost? What's the fuel efficiency? How does that work out for me in the long run? <clears throat> so I mentioned they'll consider an alternative. Those who said, yes, I will consider an alternative, fuel economy, look at that, 80%. 61% said fuel price. Now that's where we start getting interesting. Because remember I mentioned that diesel fuel was one of the most strong projected growth markets for uh, fuel demand. Diesel fuel is not as inexpensive as gasoline. We all know that. And that is a significant problem. But these are the six technologies that I would suggest, or six fuels, that are the ones who are content competing for that lost market share that gasoline is expected to give up. So diesel fuel, ethanol blended fuels, natural gas, hydrogen, and electric vehicles. I'm going to deal with each one of, in a different level because each one has different relevance in the short term and the long term. I believe that the greatest growth opportunity for this industry is in diesel in the next five to 10 years. 
every forecast I've read, every report I've read is bullish about diesel demand. So I show up here three different reports. First one here is Navigant Research. This is the forecast they did for the Fuels Institute. The middle one here, which doesn't, doesn't have 2014, is Pyra. They just did a diesel demand forecast for us. It's actually got the report out there in the, fuel, in the Future Fuel Showcase if you want to go take a look at it. And then EIA's forecast. EIA is the most pessimistic. They're suggesting by 2030, diesel vehicles will represent only around 4% of light duty vehicle sales. I discount that. I think they're completely off base. A guy in another session I was at said that EIA can't forecast next month, let alone 20 years from now. I disagree with that. I think you got to look at their numbers because they are a good benchmark. But if you look at Navigant's forecast, you look at Pyra's forecast, 12 to 14 percent market share penetration. We're only sitting at about 3 percent market share now for diesel vehicle sales. So you're seeing a significant increase in diesel vehicle sales because you're getting 20 to 40 percent better fuel economy on a diesel variant than you do on the gasoline equivalent. Now the problem is, and I'm sorry for the formatting here, diesel fuel is expensive. And remember I showed the slide, consumers say fuel price will deter them from buying an alternative fuel vehicle. It seems to the customer that diesel is expensive because it's usually 20 to 30 cents or more higher than gasoline on the fuel price sign, right? It's about 11% average over the last year or two higher than gasoline. But if a diesel engine gets 20 to 40% more miles per gallon, guess what? It's a better deal. So what this chart's showing is this line here is the average uh, diesel price reported by Opus since January 2013 compared to the gasoline price. Pretty big gap. The yellow line here, though, is the diesel gasoline gallon equivalency. Diesel has more BTUs per gallon than gasoline, so I did a calculation, put them on an even playing field. Diesel is less expensive, with the exception of this little period of time here, than gasoline is. In fact, it's been 6% lower than gasoline on a gasoline gallon equivalent. The diesel engine industry, the Diesel Technology Forum, is really focusing on trying to explain to consumers value comparison. Because if you're going to get 20 to 30% more miles per gallon, the auto industry wants you to buy those vehicles. The forecast is 30 to 40 new light duty vehicles powered by diesel in the next couple years in the domestic market. Remember I said if you go to the showroom and you have multiple options of the same vehicle with different powertrains, you are going to be able to make an informed decision. If, they, if consumers start understanding the value of diesel fuel relative to the vehicle, we could very well see a significant increase in diesel demand. In fact, EIA forecasts a 22% increase in diesel demand by 2030. I think that's probably accurate. It could even be light. Every retailer I'm talking to says, if I'm building a store or re rebuilding a store, I'm putting in diesel. Every consultant I talk to says, I'm telling my, my retail members, customers, to put in diesel fuel. You're looking at 20 to 30 30, 40 cent per gallon margins for diesel fuel compared to 12, 15 for gasoline. For the retailer, diesel makes a lot of sense. It doesn't require any special equipment. It doesn't require any special handling. You don't have to worry about um, massive problems because you don't have equipment compatibility. Diesel is something we know. It's something easy and it's a great growth market. So in the next five to 10 years, I think that's where the future lies predominantly. Now, that being said, the government likes to get involved. And when the government gets involved, we should all get very, very nervous. Because I've been lobbying Congress for 14 years. I worked for Congress for two years. They don't understand much. And I'll be fair, a member of Congress has to handle 100 to 200 issues while they're in office. They can't be an expert in anything. They have their own little niche they came to Congress with that they understand but they don't understand how the market works. So in 2007, they expanded the renewable fuel standard to 36 billion gallons by 2022. Here's why they did it. The House of Representatives that year passed a cap and trade bill called Waxman-Markey. Couldn't get it passed through the Senate, couldn't get it through the White House with President Bush. This RFS2 is all predicated on greenhouse gas emissions. Remember I told you the environment rules. Every one of these colors is a se separate mandate for a, bio, a renewable fuel concentration that's defined by their life cycle greenhouse gas reduction potential. This is a climate change program cloaked in a jacket of biofuels, agricultural promotion, domestic 
renewable fuel energy security rhetoric. Okay, into my soapbox on that. The reality is we have to get to 36 billion gallons by 2022. And if we use um, E10 ubiquitously, we're gonna get to maybe 14, 15 billion gallons. It's gonna leave us 21 billion gallons that we have to make up that's gonna have to come from higher blend product. Biodiesel is not gonna take over a big chunk, maybe two, three billion gallons, maybe. And that's being very, very bullish on biodiesel. It's gonna have to be higher blend ethanol fuels. And I'm not even gonna get into, is it corn ethanol, is it cellulosic ethanol? That, that factors into whether you comply with this mandate, but from a retail standpoint, it does not matter what your feedstock is. Ethanol behaves like ethanol, whether it is from switchgrass, corn, uh, sugarcane in Brazil, it has the same exact properties when it's blended into gasoline as every other grade of ethanol. So when you start thinking about it, where does ethanol play? Ethanol has some great price advantages. This is USDA numbers. Take a look. This is the wholesale price of gasoline, not including taxes. So this is on a, a, just a gallon equivalent. Wholesale price of ethanol. It's averaged 25 cents per gallon lower than gasoline since January 2009. I want to point out right here. The ethanol blender's tax credit expired at the end of 2011. You see a big change in the price relative between gasoline and ethanol? Not much. That leads me to think that the blender's tax credit by 2011 was not the driving force in the use of ethanol and the price of ethanol in the market. Why? Because in 2007, we took the RFS and took it up to 36 billion gallons. That's why. So for years, we had a tax credit. We had tariff restrictions on imported ethanol, and now we have a mandate. We only have the mandate now, but it is creating situations that we need to address. So how do we get there? Well, a lot of people, including the White, White House Chief of Staff, think we need to go to E85. E85 is the answer. E85 is the solution. We just need to sell more E85. Now, E85 is defined as 51 to 83% ethanol. Why is it called E85? Okay, we're not even going to get into that because that's a long story. But E85 can only be used in flexible fuel vehicles, vehicles that are equipped to run on E0 through E85. Here's the number of flex fuel vehicles in the market. The, do the dark line uh, bars here are non-flex fuel vehicle light duty vehicles on the market. This is the market percentage of the flex fuel vehicles of the light duty market. We're expecting by 2023, we might get to nine, nine and a half percent market penetration. So if E85 is the answer, or let's call it flex fuel, anything above E15, if that's the answer, 9.5% of consumers are going to have to solve the 21 billion gallon problem. The numbers don't make sense. Something else has to factor in here. And so we need to think about other products. Here's the other problem. Remember I said cafe standards are really driving a lot of the automaker production interest, right? For years, they have received a credit towards their fuel efficiency standards for every flex fuel vehicle they produced, irrespective if it used E85 or not. And I'll tell you, EIA numbers tell me that last year, the average flex fuel vehicle consumed 15 and a half gallons of E85 the entire year. That's one fill up or less. Now, that's obviously, there's a lot of them out there not ever buying. I had a flex fuel vehicle once, never filled up with the 85. Why? Because when the consumer goes to the auto dealer, they don't ask, I want a flex fuel vehicle. Maybe a couple true believers do. They buy the vehicle they want, it sometimes happens to be a flex fuel vehicle because the automaker wanted to get the cafe credit. Well, in 2019, that cafe credit automatically, that automatic cafe credit goes away. The credit will only be attributed to the automaker based upon the real use of E85 by that consumer. Guess what? How are you going to track that? And if the consumer is only buying 15 gallons of E85 a year, that automaker is not getting a credit. <clears throat> now, a lot of people say the flex fuel vehicle technology only costs 100, 200 bucks per car. That's true. However, as the auto industry starts using direct injected, turbo boosted engines, all these different technologies designed to boost fuel efficiency while maintaining performance the application of flex fuel vehicle technology becomes much more complicated and expensive. And in the absence of a CAFE credit, it is highly unlikely that they're going to continue to be committed to flex fuel vehicle production. Unless the consumer starts saying, I want a flex fuel vehicle, and the auto dealers start demanding more flex fuel vehicles on the lot, 
The only way that's going to happen is if we start getting more widespread E85 availability in the market at a price that is so compelling to the consumer that they are demanding it. Now, there's a lot of chicken and egg problems there that we don't need to get into. But this here is telling us the rate of growth in flex fuel vehicle registrations expected both by EIA and the Fuels Institute forecast. We are starting to lose growth. The increase in flex fuel vehicles in the market is slowing. And ultimately, I believe in the absence of greater consumer demand, it's going to go away. So let's think about this. If you're a retailer and you want to think, should I be selling E85, you need to think about, can I do it? Now, I mentioned only 9% of the market will be able to use E85 or a flex fuel. That's a very small market opportunity. So we are currently in the final review stages of an E85 study through the Fuels Institute that took a look at no numbers. I went out to a bunch of retailers to sell E85 and said, hey, are you willing to share with me data? I would like daily store level data on volume, price, and margins for E85 and unleaded. So I want to do a comparison at your store level, see what happened. I got data from 250 to 300 stores. <clears throat> Is it a huge sample? No, but it's almost, you know, couple percent of the existing E85 market, so it's representative at least. Here's what we found out. As we start looking at what they can do, what their average was, what the top performing stores did, here's where we're looking. Bottom quartile is looking at lower than maybe 2,500 gallons a month in E85 sales. The best performing, and I, the top 10 here, this one is what I want to point out. This, I took the top 10 E85 stores by volume in my sample, and I looked at them. How much do they sell when the price of E85 is 60 cents or more below gasoline? And that gave them about E85 at that price point average, about 7% of their unleaded volume. So it's a pretty good shift in consumer purchasing. But this is basically the best of the best, your, optimant, your uh, optimal performance for E85 you might be able to get to 37,000 gallons of E85 a month. That's a respectable volume. On average, we're looking at about 9,000 gallons. The challenge is, what's your tank configuration? If you only have two tanks, are you going to substitute a grade of gasoline to offer E85? It is unlikely that the number is going to justify doing that. However, <clears throat> if you have space, you have an extra tank, and you can put E85 in, Depending on what your equipment configuration is and your compatibility standards, could you do it for a low cost, put it in, offer your customers a product that gives you the ability on that marquee to put a fuel price up there that's 50 to 60 cents below gasoline? This the, I view this as the Walmart experience. Nobody may buy that fuel, but the customers who see you posting a price that's 50 cents below the competitors, even though it's not a fuel they can buy, that's going to impart into their mind your value operation. And maybe, like Walmart, the low price leader, not everything in Walmart is low priced. It's a matrix pricing scheme where they take a look at what products do people price shop for, and they give you the best value they can, and everything else they jack up to make their margins. So E85 has some marketability. There is opportunities there. I'm not bullish that it's going to solve the RFS problem, but I think there are opportunities there for, for retailers, and hopefully when we get this report out, they'll be able to make a more informed decision about what their options may be. <clears throat> Let me make one more comment. The other fuel that's being discussed is E15. And E15 has its own issues. 2001 and newer vehicles only, but that's about 75, almost 80% of the market now. So that we're starting to move away as time progresses. That's not as big of an issue as it was. You can get upgrades to equipment to get compatibility up to E25, which helps reduce the cost of offering. With the price of ethanol, E15 stations are pricing E15 to 5 to 10 cents below gasoline. And that is drawing customers in. Now, you have some liability issues as a retailer, but let's set all this aside. Let's say every single gallon of gas in this country had 15% ethanol, which will never happen, but let's say it did. That takes us from a 14 billion gallon ethanol market to a 21 and we still need another 15 billion gallons of renewable fuels. Let's say we get to 5 billion gallon market for E85, which is a much higher than any forecast I've seen. We are still looking at picking up, what, another 9 billion gallons of biofuel somewhere. We have problems. And so I don't know exactly where it's going to fall down, where we're going to end up. 
but that's what we're dealing with in short term is complying with the RFS and getting biofuels on the market. Now, I spent a lot of time talking about biofuels and diesel fuel because those are the two products right now that are facing retailers and are right here, immediate future. But there's a lot of talk about non-liquid fuels and a lot of interest, and natural gas is probably the one that's getting the most attention these days. If you go out on the, fuel, uh, the Future Fuel Showcase over in the North Hall, we have four natural gas vehicles on display. Go by, talk to the guys, learn about it, but keep this in mind. This is a combined forecast of, from the Fuels Institute, looking at light duty vehicles on the first section, heavy duty CNG, then heavy duty LNG. <coughs> Fuels Institute thinks that in an aggressive case situation, by 2023, 4% of heavy duty vehicles might be converted to natural gas. Light duty vehicles are negligible. Natural gas is not being presented right now in most analyses as the product for the light duty vehicle population for your consumer. It is a fleet fuel. It is most likely to gain traction in the heavy duty market. So if you're supplying a, a truck stop, you may get some interest, more interest in natural gas than uh, if you're just supplying sea stores. Pyra, who did our diesel forecast, came out with a shocking forecast and I challenged them on it. I asked them, okay guys, I understand you're being very bullish on it, but I think it's a little crazy. They say by 2030, natural gas could replace 30% of diesel demand in, in the heavy duty market. 30% from about 1% now. Like I said, I think that's a little bullish, but it's all based upon the fact that we're the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. Natural gas can be priced at 50 cents on the dollar compared to traditional fuels, and there's opportunities there. The retailer can make 50 to 75 cents per gallon margins. That's not bad. Problem is, to do that, you have to spend about a million and a half bucks to put in the infrastructure. Now, you can do the ROI if you've got a fleet that can fill up at your station, then actually, you can probably make the numbers make sense. And there is some growth there. We've seen a lot of companies in the NAX membership investing heavily in natural gas, so there are opportunities there. But it's going to be a slow ramp up. And if you're not configured to take care of fleet operators, and you're not able to get your local fleet operators to come and fill up your store, it's going to be a challenge. The other challenge is return at home fleet. So your local service distributor and delivery services, they can just plug in a natural gas line at home at their office for pretty low cost of investment do a time fill overnight, they never have to come to your store. So you really have to think about how that plays out. And does you, do you have the opportunity to generate enough revenue to take on a million and a half dollars in expense? So I forgot to put a slide up here, and I was talking to Rick before I came up here. Um, there's nothing in my presentation on electric vehicles. And you know, it's not necessarily a huge oversight. Um, electric vehicles, and I'll go from memory of a slide I used yesterday. <clears throat> EIA forecast by 2040, electric vehicles, that includes hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and battery electric vehicles, will be around 7% of light-duty vehicle sales by 2040. 5% of that 7% is traditional hybrid technology, which never plugs into the wall and operates on gasoline. Our industry sees no change with hybrids. There's a couple million of them out there on the road. We've got maybe 50 to 100 models in the market available for customers to buy to get better fuel efficiency, but they run on gasoline with a battery support. They're not going to threaten this channel of trade. They will reduce demand, but we can figure out how to get them back to the stores. Plug-in vehicles are about 1.5% of the market. <clears throat> plug-in vehicles are the ones you can plug in a home, you get maybe 40 miles range on them, 20 to 40 miles, and then a battery, and then a gasoline-driven engine kicks in to either recharge the battery or drive the vehicle. Think the Chevy Volt. You can go 40 miles on electric, then you can go about another 300 miles on gasoline. That's only going to be about 1.5% of the market. <clears throat> battery electric vehicles, what everybody is really excited about, Tesla, the new BMW i3 and i8, which are the i8 is a gorgeous vehicle. Those type of vehicles, the Nissan Leaf, plug-in only, no gasoline support. It is based 100% electric, and I may be wrong in the i8, I have to look at that again, it's a pretty new car. Um, but if you run out of charge, guess what? You can't go get a jerry can full of electricity and put it in your car. Not going to happen. You, you got to get it towed home or you got to get a really long extension cord. Recharging of vehicles takes time. Now, people talk about 
direct current chargers, the DC fast chargers, where you might be able to get a 40% recharge in five, 10 minutes. Tesla talks about using their turbochargers and you can get in 20 minutes about 80% recharge of your, in, of your battery. That's pretty cool, but how often does a customer hang out at a C store for 20 minutes? How many C store retailers want a customer parked in front of their store for 20 minutes? We average three minutes and 36 seconds from the time you leave your car, buy your product, get back out of the store. That's the average ring time in a convenience store. We don't have, unless you've got a QSR sitting there where you're selling food and they can come and buy a sandwich and have lunch, 20 minutes on your lot is not going to help. <clears throat> I also don't think the customers even want that. The battery electric vehicle market's focused on the 40 mile per day commuter. You can get to and from work on 40 miles. If you need a little bit more, maybe put a charger at your office. <clears throat> Do you ever have to stop in route to recharge? I'm starting to develop the opinion, and I could be wrong, that the battery electric vehicle market is not the market for traditional fuel retail outlets. And I'll do two, two examples, which I'm just actually speculating here, going out on a limb, it may be completely off base, and if I am, I apologize, but my suspicions are this. If you go to the Future Fuel Showcase, there's no electric vehicle on display. We asked. Future Fuel Showcase costs them nothing. It's a 10,000 square foot exhibit that NAX donated to the Fuels Institute that we made available to our auto industry colleagues within the Institute to come and show you guys and the retailers what the new vehicles are. The electric vehicle industry said no thanks. Why? Maybe because they don't need to talk to the retailers because they don't see that as a market. They're not part of the Fuels Institute. Trying to get them to come speak to our fall conference. They're not available or they can't spend the money to travel there. Is that because they just are understaffed? Or is it because they really don't see this market as the reef charging infrastructure for their, their vehicles? I don't know. But it, it's something we're gonna look into because if the recharging infrastructure is gonna be home-based and office-based only, that changes a lot for our industry if battery vehicles take off. If they are less than 2% of the market, I'm not too concerned about them stealing market share. If they take off, we need to pay attention. Now, there are problems with the <coughs> rapid expansion of the electric vehicle market. Let's say they come out with a new battery technology tomorrow that can take a charge in five minutes and get you 80% recharge and maybe give you 150 miles in like five minutes. That sounds pretty cool. That gives us an opportunity within our market to offer a fast charge Come by our store, grab a cup of coffee, spend five minutes, get enough juice to get where you want to go. That makes electric vehicles more long-term, more long-range potential. The problem is, one, batteries are nowhere near that capability, and the experts I've spoken with have indicated they don't anticipate we're going to get there anytime soon because unless we come up with a whole new battery technology that does not use existing components. Second of all, the electricity grid can't deliver the power that would be required to charge those batteries that fast. Think about it. If you've ever done any electrical work at your house, you use a certain gauge wire based upon the amperage and the load you expect to be using. The electricity transmission system has done the same thing. So we're going to increase the power draw at a retail location to recharge an electric vehicle. Guess what? You don't just have to increase the panel in your store. We may have to start thinking about rewiring the system. You ever think about the transmission system of the electricity grid in this country? Replacing it is not an option. Take another step. California is where most of these EVs are being, being introduced. California loves electric vehicles. They want to get away from liquid fuels because they want zero emission. Get it. Understand environmental objectives. California is the home of the rolling brownouts a couple years ago. Now. The recession hit California really hard. My family is from California, so I hope I'm not speaking out of turn and ticking off people from California. I left California a long time ago. I won't be going back. California is still not going back to work. I think the unemployment is still close to two di double digits. The economy is dying. Companies are leaving California. So we may not get to an electricity demand level where brownouts reoccur. But let's say it recovers. Like, it's a beautiful state. There's a tremendous opportunity there. Let's say the economy recovers and 
demand for electricity re returns to what it was 10 years ago. But now we have a huge electric vehicle population demanding more power. At the same time, they've got two nuclear power plants that are shutting down this year. So they're kind of disarming themselves to be able to handle the higher load demand for electricity. There's so many different things going into this that are concerning that I really don't think, and I've talked a lot about this, and I apologize, I don't think electric vehicles are an opportunity for our industry or really a threat. I think they're out there, they're interesting, they're cool, there's something to talk about, something to think about, but I don't think we need to be worried about it or doing a whole lot to accommodate them anytime soon unless something changes, in which case I'll come back and tell you I was wrong. Wouldn't be the first time, and I guarantee you it won't be the last time, just ask my wife. Um, but there is another way. <clears throat> Hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles. Yes, hydrogen is a futuristic concept. When Bush said we're addicted to oil, he said, by the, I think he said by 2016, a child born today will be able to buy a hydrogen electric vehicle, the Freedom Car Initiative, and everybody said, yay, let's start talking about it, and then pfft, it just kind of fizzled. I was involved in a couple coalitions that were looking at it, and it just kind of fell apart. And I thought for a long time, hydrogen, okay, sounds cool, you know, it's the most ubiquitous, uh, gas in the, in the world, zero emissions, wonderful, it ain't going to happen. <clears throat> Until I started talking to the auto industry. The reason I tell my members to think about hydrogen, not now, not 10 years from now, but maybe 15, 20 years from now as an opportunity, is because the auto industry is investing billions of dollars a year in research and development into hydrogen fuel cell technology. Some of the biggest automakers are starting to shift hybrid electric research and development dollars to hydrogen because hydrogen doesn't present the same issues electric vehicles do. Okay? <coughs> hydrogen vehicles fuel in three to five minutes at a dispenser, not at an outlet. They give you a range of 300 to 400 miles per fill-up, just like a gasoline car. The consumer interface is very similar to gasoline and diesel fuel. So you've got a lot of similarities there. It's a zero emission vehicle. It is an electric vehicle that is independent of the grid. We don't need more coal fire power plants to provide electricity for hydrogen vehicles. We need hydrogen. Now, how do you get hydrogen there? That's where the rub is. There's a rolled out process out in California, a demonstration project, and I think they're doing this the right way. So often we come up with an idea and say, we just need to do it. Let's just let's put it out there and everybody do it at once. Biofuels comes to mind. Um, the hydrogen market rollout is being strategic. They're looking at Southern California and the Bay Area with a couple corridors in between to connect the two communities. They're bringing the vehicles to market while they're helping to build hydrogen stations. So Hyundai came out with their fuel cell vehicle, Tucson, earlier this year in Southern California, I think at four dealerships only. Why? Because those four dealerships were close proximity to hydrogen refueling stations. They're releasing it for, for $4.99 a month, and they're paying for the hydrogen during the term of the lease to get people in there, to get the experience, to learn. And as they're learning, as the hydrogen industry is learning what, how it works, they're going to try to roll it out and, and spread it across the country. Figure it out in a small, contained environment. Learn what works, what doesn't. Perfect it. Identify the challenges. Get the cost down. Then spread it out. Strategy makes sense. Will it work? I don't know. It's a long process. I want to point out, see this really bullish forecast for fuel cell vehicles in 2023? Uh, that's 70,000 vehicles. And I was expressing concern because flex fuel vehicles are only going to be 25 million. This is 70,000, and that's extremely bullish forecast. Hydrogen refueling facilities are two, two and a half million dollars. All that being said, so many challenges, so many hurdles. If the auto industry is committed to this, and they are absolutely committed to it, we as an industry have to pay attention. Hydrogen does not present a threat to our industry. Customers are not going to be producing hydrogen at home. They're not going to be tapping into a pipeline and bringing hydrogen to their house. That's not going to happen. This industry will be selling the hydrogen if it becomes in demand. So we're a long way from it, but it's something to think about. <clears throat> So just the last couple thoughts here. As I said, environmental protection reigns supreme. If it's not going to protect the environment or improve emissions, it's not even going to get on 
the cutting room floor. We're not going, we're not backsliding. And you know, I live in the political world. The animosity between the political parties, one, makes me sad. It used to anger me, now I'm just sad. This is it's pretty, really pathetic. But it also makes me laugh because they try to categorize and eat in quick statements what the other side thinks. So the liberals go, the conservatives want to pollute. All they want to do is pollute and destroy our, our environment. No, they don't. Just like the conservatives say all those liberal whack jobs, all they care about is the environment. They don't care about the economy. No, they care. They're different perspectives. Some believe consumers should pay a little bit more for environmental protection. Others think, yeah, let's protect the environment, let's do it incrementally, and let's not just go over the, over the edge and plunge ourselves into economic challenges. I think there's a happy medium. I think there's a balance to be made. The challenge is, can you get these two sides to sit in a room and talk about it? That's what we're trying to do the Fuels Institute. We'll see if it works. That's what we're trying to do. All right, so, so as I mentioned, sustainability has to be environmentally sustainable and economically sustainable. The budget of the customer has to be a paramount concern of the introduction of a new technology. If it does not make economic sense, it will not survive the market. So we need to take a look at the environmental objectives. That's criteria, air pollutants, and greenhouse gas. Whether you think humans are contributing to climate change, or you think it's a natural evolution of our Earth, reducing emissions of greenhouse gases and criteria air pollutants is a good thing. I am the kind of guy, I don't want people to try to scare me into doing the right thing. I have a real hard time with the alarm to say, if we don't do this right now, the world's going to implode in 2025. I have a hard time with that line of argument. But reducing emissions is good for the environment, it's good for public health, it's good for the economy if, by doing so, we're promoting economic growth. And you can do that. Now, everybody's going to argue, the president says that his you know, the Green Jobs program is a great program, we're going to do environmental uh, improvements, it's going to create jobs, and the Republicans go, you're out of your mind, what are you doing? You're completely greenwashed on the whole topic. Look, if we can create economic growth and protect the environment, that's what we need to do, and we need to all get on board doing it. And I think we're, we can move that way if we can get rid of the rhetoric. Long-term economic advantage will determine which technologies went out. <clears throat> there is a senator, um, Senator Wyden from Oregon, for a while he was chairman of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. He told me, John, I really envision a station in the future with 15, 10 to 15 different fueling options. <laughs> I looked at him and said, man, that's a lot of space. At the same time, incoming chairman, Steve Lair of a Quick Trip, sent me a photograph of his price sign that had 10 different fueling options. Oh man, you're not helping me here, man. <laughs> Come on. I understand it's possible, but it doesn't make sense. In the short term, yeah, I think we're going to have stations that have five or six different fueling options for a period of time. But we're going to find out some of them won't survive, some of them will thrive, and the ones that don't survive will die off because nobody's going to buy them. RLY is key, and most important, and this is a message I deliver to the biofuels industry all the time, we have to deliver alternatives and technology solutions, fuel options, that can survive in the economy without the government propping them up. Tax incentives, mandates, all these things have to be temporary in nature. And they have to sunset because if the government is making something economically viable, that means it's not economically viable. If it's economically viable, the government needs to get out of the way and let the market figure it out. Now, I told you, I work with Congress. They don't like hearing that. They really think they're here to help. And that's fine. Help us identify the challenges that regulations are presenting to market development. Help us overcome those challenges. And with that, I'll open up. If you guys have any questions, we have a few more minutes. Is there any questions that I can answer? Yes, Christy. Uh, 